All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of the Fiat Free Twitter Space, co hosted by Trezor. And today we will discuss Bitcoin adoption in Nigeria. And before we get into it, just some organizational matters. This space is recorded and will be published later on the Trezor YouTube channel. Uh, and listeners, please feel free to raise your hand throughout the discussion. I can see uh, many people from Nigeria here, so that's going to be a fruitful discussion, I hope. And yeah, let's get into it. So today we will talk about Bitcoin in Nigeria with our dear guests Abu Bakar Nur Khalil and Obin Wosu. And just a short introduction, Abu Bakar is a Bitcoin core contributor from Nigeria, CEO and CTO at Recursive Capital, and he's active in Kuala and B-Trust non-profit organizations that we will discuss later in the session. And Obi is a founder of the CoinFloor Exchange that he now sold, and he's also part of the B-Trust. And now Obi is mostly focused on the Fedi app, which we will also discuss. So hi, Abu Bakar. Hi, Obi. Thank you for joining this session. Thanks for having me, Joseph. Great. Hi. 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 Perfect. So, uh, Abu Bakar, I was wondering, and you probably get uh, this question a lot, why do you hate 1999? Yeah, unfortunately, it's one of those things where I guess immaturity takes takes precedent and then bears the burden of your legacy. So I was about like, I think probably 11, 12 when I joined Twitter. So at that time, I honestly don't know why I picked, I hate 1999, especially given that's my birth year. So probably some sort of <laughs> attempt at being cool, I guess, at the time. All right. All right. Cool. No problem. Thank you. So uh, yeah, Abu Bakar, uh, Nigeria uh, is the Africa's largest economy, uh, but it suffers from high price inflation for several years now. Uh, I've seen that the inflation is around 19% now, but the food prices are rising even faster. So I was wondering, um, from like your observations, is there a, like palpable tension in the country regarding these macroeconomic developments? Like, what's what's uh, uh, what's the environment now in Nigeria from the perspective of like ordinary people and how do they cope with this high inflation? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of frustration and it's not only frustration, it's really a general lack of hope for a lot of people. So in terms of the economic situation, like you said, there's not only inflation, but there's also a food crisis. So not only are people bearing the brunt of inflation, but they're also hungry <laughs> while going through that sort of calamity. So I think there's a lot of frustration, there's a lot of tension, and we see that. And the one metric I think we could hone on to in terms of seeing how this is best expressed is in terms of how a lot of Nigerians tend to flock to either stable coins or Bitcoin, just for the simple fact that the NARA is simply not working for them. And obviously, we expect, this, we expect this trend to continue for at least as long as the NARA doesn't serve the, the indigents of Nigeria. So we'll likely continue to see a lot of people flocking to some of these currencies like Bitcoin that actually give them financial freedom and allows them to actually live their lives without fear of, you know, inflation. Yeah. And so what's the stance of the government or the central bank towards Bitcoin? I, from what I've read, it's not very favorable, right? <laughs> you can definitely say that again. It's definitely not favorable. And again, it's mostly reactionary. This is still off the tail end of, you know, 2017, a lot of the fears in general when it comes to regulators around the world. And specifically with Nigeria, it's like there's this weird balance or should I say a lack of between the SEC as well as the CBN where, you know, you have the former at least trying their best to build out frameworks in order to allow for individuals to actually build these sort of solutions on, you know, Bitcoin and some of these other uh, coins around. But at the same time, you also have the CBN, which is super, super apprehensive when it comes to Bitcoin. And a lot of that really has to do with uh, currency controls, uh, currency control issues. So not only are they, you know, ensuring that individuals are using the NARA to avoid the bleeding from, you know, currency, I guess, uh, exchange rates with the US dollar, they're also looking to do that around Bitcoin. And just in general, the fear of Bitcoin being a tool for scammers is still something that's commonplace in terms of their ideology in, in, in the CBN. Uh, all right. Uh, so 
is it uh, the case that the central bank has banned like financial institutions in providing services to exchanges and stuff? Because that's sort of like my impression. Uh, and that would mean like there are no exchanges in place probably, or what's, what's the situation there in, in terms of uh, like centralized exchanges? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people have that misunderstanding in terms of the CBN circular that came out, I think, a year or two ago, and really doesn't ban exchanges per se. It just bans explicit um, transactions that have to do with Bitcoin with exchanges. So, for example, in the past, they used to have narrations with Bitcoin, for example, in transactions. So it was very, very easy for them to monitor and say, hey, you know, this is a Bitcoin transaction going from exchange A to account B. But nowadays, there are still a lot of exchanges. So the only difference is a lot of people have moved to P2P. Specifically, they're doing, you know, a, a lot of exchange, uh, a lot of volumes on Binance P2P, for example. And there are still other ways individuals still on-ramp and off-ramp through, you know, applications on wallets like Bitnow, for example, which has, as of recently, really had a huge uptake as a result of the Lightning integration. Uh -huh. Okay, perfect. And all right. So, um, and what's the accessibility of dollars? Uh, you mentioned currency controls in place. So, how are dollars accessible or other foreign currencies in Nigeria? Yeah, so in general, there are a variety of ways. Cash is still accessible. So, you can go to your local Baruda challenge, depending on where you are, to actually get cash, exchange it for a bank transfer, or get Naira and then get cash USD itself. And then there's also individuals that use the Missler accounts, although the The issue with that is there are a lot of issues and restrictions on the apps themselves. So sending in between two separate accounts is an on and off type of stuff. So sometimes you're able to send it to folks, sometimes you're not. And another thing is obviously with regards to folks that actually have Bitcoin, there are also a lot of people that exchange that via you know, Binance P2P to actually get dollars. And a lot of people also use applications on wallets like Bitnob who have a USD account which is a way more convenient way to actually store dollars than having physical greenbacks, for example. All right, all right. And how about, for example, ATMs, uh, like Bitcoin ATMs? Are there Bitcoin ATMs in Nigeria? Uh, no, we have, I think, one or two in Lagos, if I recall. I'm not too sure whether they're operational or not, but it's definitely not a common sighting. All right. And yeah, so... Another thing, uh, I was wondering, you had like these SARS protests against like the speci special police forces several years ago. And from what I read, uh, Bitcoin was used uh, at that time for donating to like this cause of like the protesters. Uh, so, but you also mentioned like Bitcoin has this bad reputation for being like a currency of scammers in Nigeria. So how has the public perception of Bitcoin shifted over the past few years, maybe in connection with the SARS protest? Yeah, in general, I mean, if, if you really look at the evolution of how the conversation has been in general in, in the public forum, one of the things you definitely notice is initially a lot of people were apprehensive. A lot of people thought, you know, Bitcoin was a scam and, you know, It's not really a thing where you go, yeah, they're, they're definitely wrong, a lot of FUD. The truth is, a lot of scams did come and penetrate the the, the continent, especially Africa, especially Nigeria. And there are a lot of scams under the banner of Bitcoin. But over the years, especially post, post I think, 2018-19, the convo started shifting towards people actually using Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation, as a store of value. And then post, pre, post the protest, a lot of people moved i guess that protest really it, it moved the conversation to a point beyond okay store of value to actual full-on financial freedom because that was the first time individuals saw that you know your bank account could get locked up for simply having speech that the state doesn't want you to have for example and, and protesting in general so a lot of people realized that wow bitcoin actually is a practical solution when it comes to actually regaining your or, or retaining your your privilege to financial i guess uh what do you call it, freedom of speech and, and all those rights. So definitely a lot more people are open to Bitcoin via a lot of avenues, whether it's a store of value or just a tool to protect their freedom of speech, for example. Uh-huh. And, okay, so I've also read that the central bank has launched e Naira last year, uh, a CBDC, basically, and I believe that's one of the first CBDCs in the world So, yeah, I can see you're laughing already. So I'm just curious, like, uh, 
it does it have any traction what's the like public perception of that like what what's it all about you know the thing is nigerians are very very intelligent especially folks that use use currencies on a daily basis whether you're trying to run a business you're trying to just live day by day so i mean the number one problem with the cbdc's or in general with inera specifically is a lot of people realize first and foremost that a lot of currencies around the world are digital really the bulk of it especially in the us for example is a lot of it is digital really with physical cash taking up like less than a percent in nigeria is a similar scenario so a lot of people already know that this is just a rebrand at best and it's not really something novel per se um on top of that nigerians also know that the e naira is still the naira is still the same naira that has a lot of crap you know inflation and and is battling against against the dollar for the last couple of years right now so for them it's it's the case where they see no additional value of going to this rebranded naira because it's still the same naira that still has all these issues that they're facing so as far as the general populace is concerned you know they've launched it for themselves as far as they're concerned as nobody is going onto the e naira it's available on a couple of bank apps but only a small portion of people actually use it like folks in the cbn but everyone outside really is still sticking to either dollars or or bitcoin all right yeah so thanks um okay so sometimes we can read like studies that show that like around the third of nigerian population uses bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in some way which seems kind of huge because uh, nigeria has like 200 million uh population which is really huge so that would mean there's like 50 million bitcoin users in nigeria so from your experience is that the case is bitcoin or let's say stable coins that widely used in the country Yeah definitely it and it's it's a trend that keeps keeps growing well, year on year so specifically with bitcoin it's been it's been growing drastically and stable coins as of the last two years specifically because a lot of people haven't really had the best i guess uh, experience with the price cycle with with bitcoin because a lot of them are coming in quite recently so for them the the price volatility is something that they simply cannot contend with especially on a day-to-day basis so a lot of them flock to stable coins and we kind of see this as a transitional i guess medium for them to get comfortable with bitcoin and digital currencies in general so yeah a lot of people are using stable coins and bitcoin and often a combination of both uh huh all right so maybe uh let's bring obi into discussion as well so obi i'm wondering um you are not based in nigeria right right now right I'm not based in Nigeria. No. Yeah, so sorry. I was wondering if you might to visit oh, West Africa on a general basis going forward. Uh-huh. So maybe if you could give, give us uh, like a picture of uh for let's say is Bitcoin used for remittances into Nigeria and I don't know how huge uh corridor that is but I would imagine it's could be quite big so uh, how do you for example from your side how do you send money to nigeria if you need to like is uh like uh the usd rails usable or do you have to go through bitcoin or stable coins you're asking me for my personal um sending of money to nigeria well yeah i'm just uh, asking like uh if the usd rails are actually usable from abroad or if it's more convenient to go through bitcoin so there are, there are different options to send money back to nigeria and so there are actually quite a lot of options it's more of an issue in the case of nigeria of price so you have to deal with are you getting the official rate or are you getting the real rate that most people want to pay if i i'm i'm willing to pay the official rate then i have a lot of very standard options but the official rate is significantly below the actual rate that people are willing to pay for US dollars or GBP or euro something it, sometimes it could be 20 30% below the actual rate that people are willing to pay so by taking that rate and using the standard standard services you're taking a massive haircut in terms of what 
number of nairas that number of naira that actually gets into the hands of of people you wanted to get into the hand of all right yeah so i wasn't aware of, like there's an official rate like a regulated one and then like the real one so yeah that's interesting um okay so uh i mean let's... just to be clear the, the i mean it's the official rates or real rates it's more that there's an official rate and then there's a rate that other people are willing to pay um which is significantly above that rate which suggests that the official rate and the market rate are are not the same thing mm -hmm. yeah i see so uh Let's discuss Feddy now, or Feddy Mint and your project Feddy. So, uh, please, give you just uh, give us like an elevator pitch. What's the project about? What kind of problem it solves in Nigeria? Is it focused on Nigeria actually, or the whole world? And when we will see it in action? Okay. Um, well, it's um, in terms of its focus, it's 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 global scale Bitcoin custody. So it's the whole world, and Nigeria is part of that. Um, in terms of what it is, it's a custody solution which brings a concept of the community working together to create a way of custodying Bitcoin or potentially other assets like stable coins on behalf of the community um, as an alternative to each person within a community figuring out how to custody Bitcoin themselves, no matter what their technical capability is or, or um, financial means are, etc. And it also is an alternative to each member of the community trying to find a centralized regulated exchange to handle custody for them. Again, if they're able to do that, that's great. But in many parts of the world, For billions of people, that option is just not an option. And even if it is an option for them, um, the regulated exchange may not be wanting to accept them as a customer. And then you run in the risks, as you've seen, even as recently as in the last few weeks, where regulated exchanges holding large amounts of, of Bitcoin on behalf of their customers end up doing things that are not in the interest of the customers resulting ultimately with the customers losing access to their to their Bitcoin. So we provide a solution where instead of relying on these third parties that you don't know or trying to do it all yourself, we find a middle ground where a community comes together and and custodies their assets, their valuable um, cryptographic crypto assets themselves on behalf of themselves. And that's what Feddy Mint is. Feddy is a wallet just like any other Bitcoin wallet or um, Lightning wallet, which provides a really easy user-friendly interface to a given community's um, Fediment community wallet. And it also allows you to access multiple wallets in the same way if you're using Slack, you can be a member of multiple Slack groups or you're using Discord, you can be a member of multiple Discord groups or you're using WhatsApp, you could be a member of multiple groups. With with Feddy Wallet, you could be a member of multiple Feddy Mint community wallets, so you don't have to hold all your Bitcoin in one place, and you can move across from one Feddy Mint federation to another with a simple low cost Lightning transaction. So, from a user's point of view, it's as simple as using a Lightning wallet. Yeah, and the trust model is based on like a federation right it's not like a single point of failure but there's a federation like the custody is actually uh, a, a federation right yeah so what's what's unique um sort of a bit like bitcoin there are a number of different ideas and elements that had been created or invented in the preceding 10 to 20 or more years and What Satoshi did is he put them together to create Bitcoin. Um, in the case of uh, Fediment, there are a number of preceding ideas. The first being Xiaomi and Mint, where you get the Fediment, uh, the Mint part of the Fediment name. These are a form of privacy, a privacy protocol that's actually incredibly strong privacy, 
uh, in fact, some of the best privacy that we can theoretically make. Um, and they've been around since 1983. So nearly 40 years was when this idea, the idea that came, that, that was behind Charm Mint. It was created by a guy called David Charm, someone that um, Satoshi Nakamoto actually referenced in his original white paper. Um, incredible idea for privacy, but it required the use of fiat money, which is a centralized form of money. And it required the use of um, a bank, a centralized bank to hold the fiat money because fiat requires, you cannot hold a pound note amongst 10 different people. Only one person can hold fiat money, cash dollars, pounds, euros. And then fast forward 2009, um, oh, 2008, 2009, Satoshi Nakamoto invented Bitcoin, which was the first time where we could create a censorship-resistant money. And also, importantly, it was the first time we could create money that was um, able to be held by multiple people at the same time using a technology called multi-signature. So multiple people can hold a certain amount of Bitcoin, which is not possible with fiat. And you fast forward again to... 2017, 2018, where a company called Blockstream, which is a very well-known company in the Bitcoin space, came up with an idea called Federations, which is, is used with their liquid network, which is a way of being able to take one process, one program that normally is run by one person and have it run by multiple people together so that a majority of them need to agree before the program actions. And as, even if, as long as the majority are honest, a minority acting badly can't prevent it from occurring. Once those three elements came by, my co-founder and a couple of other cypherpunks and hardcore um, hackers and, and engineer, computer science engineers hit upon the idea of combining all these concepts together. So could we take the idea of federations to split this one process up amongst multiple people, use that to split up the Xiaomi and Mint privacy protocol, so not just one bank, but multiple people working together. And then instead of using depositing fiat cash into the system, depositing Bitcoin, which is money that can also be split in ownership, split amongst multiple people, to create a federated Chamia Mint. And there were three projects that's, that launched at the same time, but only one, Feddy Mint, had continued to be developed and worked upon until very recently, in fact, last year when I met um, Eric um, in the Hackers' Congress in, in Prague, um, did we have a functioning version of this? And that's where Feddy Mint was born. And when I saw it and when I met it, I, I was looking for a solution to getting, doing two things. One, providing an option to the billions of people around the world who are either excluded from a price point of view or from a complexity point of view um, or from a fair point of view of self-custing and are also excluded from using exchanges, um, which are centralized and because they're regulated, may not be willing to have everybody as a customer or the people who are using exchanges because they don't because they don't feel there's another option for them and getting those billions of users off exchanges and i realized that Feddy Mint was that solution so not only do you get incredible privacy but it's a solution to get 90 to 95 percent of people who are currently holding money on exchanges off exchanges and in time some of them could be promoted to the point where they can self-custody but the first step is to get them off exchanges. Okay, perfect explanation of uh, Fediment. And I'm finally starting to understand. I would also recommend uh, our listeners to check out Alex Gladstein's article on Fediment. That was also a great explanation. A great article. Yeah, it's on Bitcoin Magazine of uh, FYI. Um, so I'm just wondering, the Federation members, how will they get to safeguard that Bitcoin. Uh, there's still a recovery seat for the individual members that they have to like safeguard, right? So just just for the clarity, um, I because a member is ambiguous. 
So I would say users, who are the people who use the system, and guardians are the people who mm -hmm. are running or who have been the community has decided will take on the responsibility of of being part of the federation and running the federation software, the Fedimint software. So because um, they're all they're both members in a, depending on your context. So if we, I think you're talking about the guardians in that question. And in that context, each one of those will run a full node. They will get um, a private key and a public key that they need to safeguard. And they will form a multi-signature wallet, which is the wallet for the community. But each one of those will need to maintain a backup of their own private key. So that could be done with a device like a Trezor or a, a ledger or so on. Um, um, it could be done with um, maintaining a 24-word seed um, and storing that. But it's, if you've got a community of 500 people or 1,000 people and you've got five um, guardians or 10 guardians, that's 10 people who have to do that as opposed to 1,000 people who have to do that. And so that cost and that effort is one given to the most reliable, trustworthy, diligent people within your community. So it's more likely to be done correctly. And also from a cost point of view, that cost could be amortized across, spread across all of the community as opposed to each person having to incur the cost, which it may not be uh, as scalable and as practical. Okay. And when do you think uh, like an initial version of Fedi will be available for people to That's the most often asked question, but um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're aiming for a Signet version. So this is like um, not production Bitcoin, but the, like a testnet um, version of Bitcoin because Bitcoin has its own testnet um, for this month. And then um, we're aiming for more announcements. We've said publicly Q1 2023. But but watch the space over the coming few months for uh, for um, production releases as well. But our approach is we're very much focused on um, obviously getting it into hands of a lot of different people, both um, Feddy Mints as well, communities setting up their own community wallets. So going from be your own bank to be your own community bank, but also from a commercial point of view, getting as many people to use Feddy, which we will be the first wallet that's Feddy Mint aware, but we're hoping there'll be other wallets that are Feddy Mint aware. Um, but ultimately, we want um, also to focus on security, uh, given what we're doing. Um, the system should be very easy to use, very secure, very safe. Um, so we, we balance the need for safety and security versus the needs to hit commercial goals and roll out. All right, perfect, thanks. So maybe one question for Abu Bakar. Uh, what's the recursive capital's uh, role in the Fedi project? I've seen you are involved, right, with, uh, with your fund? Yeah, we're invested. Okay. Cool. Uh, and are there any other investments in the project or are you like a single VC back? No, there are definitely a lot more VCs backing, backing Fedi. It's all on their website. If you go to fedi.xyz, you'll see all the list of folks that have backed the project. There are other incredible folks like 1031, um, you know, Death Eagle Capital, Kingsway ETC. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, let's move on to other topic. Um, I have recently read an article by Heritage Faladum, who is here uh, as a listener as well, on the feature phones in Africa, like uh, not smartphones, but usually just uh, manual button phones. So what would you say is the share of feature phones in Nigeria? Because for, for like advanced, let's say, Bitcoin wallets that I would consider Fedius as well, we probably need like uh, classic smartphones, right? Uh, and I don't know, like, what's uh, the percentage of feature phones in Nigeria specifically? Yeah, so according to current stats, we could try and extrapolate based on, you know, mobile broadband data and some of the data from, I think, 2016 by the Nigerian Communication Commission. I think it's about 
let's say 60 something percent, the high 60s in terms of the distribution across the country. But we're seeing a huge uptake in smartphone adoption as well, because in 2016, it was around 30 percent and now it's around 40 percent. So we can expect that it could probably balance out within the decade or probably in the next five years or so, depending on what the trajectory is. But yeah, to your point about in general adoption and, and products and services that we need to be focusing on, obviously, given the sheer amount of you know future phones in terms of demographics, I think that's why the push for creating products via USSD or that are USSD enabled is definitely one that's very, very helpful and useful in terms of getting those adoption numbers we need. So with regards to Fedi and other projects and their parity on feature phones, that's definitely a conversation that they'll be relaying on a project by project basis. But there are definitely other projects as well, like Matrankura's USSD project, where you could actually sell by and then use Bitcoin via the Lightning Network currently. So we're definitely seeing a lot more people focus on the USSD angle. And I'm sure other projects will also integrate on or at least be considerate about what the general demographics are like in terms of these devices. Yeah. <clears throat> I've read about Machangura uh, and I believe Bittext, and that was amazing. Like, wow, you can actually use Bitcoin through these feature phones. Uh, right. So uh, let's talk about uh, Koala. That's, um, and I would like to talk about Koala and Bitrust and what's, uh, what's basically the mission of Koala and who is the project working with in terms of students. I believe it's focused on like, uh, students of uh, that are interested in Bitcoin development, right? Yeah. All right. So, uh, what's uh, what's the program? Who who is it for? Yeah. So basically, especially when when we started um, Gala, this was off off the bat of convos with Bernard, which I see in the crowd as well. But basically, the whole idea is, especially starting out, there's a huge gap in terms of the developer talent in the Bitcoin and Lightning space. So that's one of the first things that we aim to solve. Now, how we aim to solve it is what we decided on early on, which is to focus on that top end of the funnel, which is developers that can already code. And we're essentially just there to reskill them. So the idea behind the product is really to increase the number of Bitcoin and Lightning developers in Africa in general. But the method in which we take is, first of all, through a study group, it was like six weeks, and then an actual seminar, then the main program. In the main program, we take about 10, 12 participants. In the last cohort, we did 12. And we actually pay them on a monthly basis to strictly learn about Bitcoin and build out their portfolio. And immediately after they're done with the project, because we're in communication and contact with folks like Galoy and some of the other Bitcoin projects in the space, like BitNob as well, they are guaranteed jobs or, well, not guaranteed, that's a strong word, but they, they actually get jobs at the end of the program, which is the case, I guess, with the last cohort as well. So you could definitely expect to see a lot more of the cohorts go to Bitcoin companies. And down the line, we expect to see a lot more Bitcoin companies from Africa. So it could truly be, I guess, more inclusive of a lot of these projects that are coming up and springing up from the continent. So in general, that's really the mission with Gala, which is to really produce these devs that simply do not exist in the ecosystem. And with Btrust is more of a high level approach, which is to grow the ecosystem in general. And the, the, the I guess the strategy we're taking is to actually get these developers in, into the space, which is you know via grants. And as, as recent as I think two or three weeks ago, we announced our first um, recipient of the of our grants, which is, you know, Vlad, who also was a graduate of Gala, which, you know, just by virtue of having no projects that exist like Gala. So we'll definitely see a lot more people come out from Gala or outside of Gala to actually get funded by Btrust as well to work on Bitcoin and other projects in the space. All right, cool. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, our listeners if anybody wants to join the discussion, just raise your hands and join in. Um, yeah, and... I was also wondering what are the educational resources in Nigeria for Bitcoin? Do you have like notable like book authors, YouTubers? And yeah, we are Heritage is joining us as well. So maybe he could address that. All right. Hi, Heritage. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, you seem to be breaking out, breaking off. Uh, I can hear you now, Sat. 
I can hear you. Can you hear me clearly now? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yes. Um. What, what was your question? I mean, I joined the space to like um contribute and buttress some point in the course of the discussion, but I didn't listen. Probably you've called me up to like um keep speaking now. Yeah. So I I was just wondering uh, what are some educational resources in Nigeria focused on Bitcoin, and I believe you have a podcast, right? That's uh. It's based in Nigeria and focused on Bitcoin. Um, yes, that's true, Sad Joseph. Um, when it comes to like um, Bitcoin education and adoption, coupled with um, information, um, start serving as the driving cause for this adoption. I mean, um, Obi and Abubakar have been able to reference some, which is um, stuff like. Um, having low cost and um, easy access to to bitcoin services which um we are glad with the in inclusion of featured phone enabling financial inclusion and also um color coming up with um developers program but the interesting part is also like um taking the root cause of education from the grassroots in order for people to be able to understand the usage and um getting the concept of the onboarding process from the crypto ecosystem itself to Bitcoin. So when we're talking about services like that, I mean, the ones I'm cognizant of um, is actually DGOT and, um, and also the Bitcoin in Nigeria media, which are some big taking coverage around education and insightful um, information coming out of the Nigeria space. But then I'm always of the word that without education, there won't be adoption, just as you said. So when we're talking about educational contents and all, I mean, we, we need to like get people to understand the context of money, the white paper, and um, whatever services Bitcoin has for them. So that's what exactly I'm focusing on right now, sad to self and trader, if I'm going to be honest with you. Um, that's what brings about DGOT majorly for Bitcoin education and adoption. So when Color Africa keeps working on training developers, um, and then we, you see other platforms keep coming, focusing on education as well. So that's just my contribution to the space. And um, that's my um, precise response to your question about educational contents available. All right, perfect. Thanks. So we've got Dr. Rio Etze joining as well. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Yes, I can hear. Okay. Um. Um. So nice to be here. Um. For a very long time now. Um, to be frank with you, I am happy to be here with um, Obi because um, as far back as um, 2016, Obi was uh, actually one of the people who solidified some of us, our conviction in Bitcoin in those days. Uh, you know, it was during the era of uh, Binance and the rest, lots of, um, you know, shitcoin exchanges. And um, I discovered then that, um, you know, CoinFloor was the only um, exchange that was Bitcoin only. And uh, that was when I, you know, started following me. And I was like, why is this the only exchange in the midst of, um, you know, all the hula balloa about, um, you know, so many exchanges selling lots of uh, crap. And uh, he was just there, Bitcoin only. So he actually helped some of us in our journey. So coming to, I don't want to overflow some of the issues and some of the you know economic um, woes that we have in Nigeria. He has been highlighted by uh, Abu Bakr. Boy, it is so terrible down here that, that um, you know, cars are now like... Um, you know, assets in Nigeria, you know, cars, cars are like a um, store of value here. You know, instead of um, keeping your money in Naira, people buy cars with 
with their money because at the end of the day, your car, will, you know, we say is a depreciating asset. It's not a depreciating asset in Nigeria, so it's as it's, it's as it's as bad as that. Um, coming to Bitcoin education, who most of us have been in the in the field for for years now, and um, the perception is changing, uh, you know, rapidly. Um, as of 2016, it's going like, you know, a scam. Mm -hmm. But like, um, it's, okay. it's a Ponzi. But presently, the perception is, it has actually changed over the years. You wanted to ask something? Yeah, I was uh, wondering, uh, and I don't know, Abu Bakar, or maybe you can address that. Like, what do you think is the future of Bitcoin in Nigeria? Do you think like uh, the government and the central bank will keep on uh, like creating these obstacles for broader adoption? But Bitcoin is already quite heavily adopted in Nigeria. So will they like declare war on Bitcoin or will they actually admit Bitcoin is good for the country and maybe go like the El Salvador way or Like, what's your opinion on that? Maybe Abu Bakar, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the utopian world, by next year, we should have more friendly Bitcoin regulation. But unfortunately, I think in the short term, they're still going to stick their head in the sand, frankly speaking. And this isn't a result of, you know, having any sort of malice towards Bitcoin. Like I said, this is strictly just a reactionary thing from them. So I think it's going to continue to be the elephant in the room. They're going to still try and maintain the status quo of making it a bit difficult for people to access Bitcoin as part of their plans of currency controls in general and other ta well, tactics <laughs> and other methods to try and help with the economic situation we're seeing. And just even out on top of that, there's also a fuel crisis, which is why I think Dr. Leo was bringing up the issues with cars. And in general, like I said, I mean, in the meantime, we're still going to see this. I just think long-term, probably the next five, 10 years, we'll likely see them acknowledge Bitcoin and provide regulation that's actually useful and will help with the adoption in general. So I think that's probably what will happen. Um. Yeah. Can I can I contribute? Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Hey, um, hi everyone. Um, I'm Uyayo. I had um investments um in convexity in Abuja. So in short, um, convexity is is pretty much like a blockchain hub. Um, pretty much. Um. So yeah. About about CBN regulation. Um. We've been we've been talking to the central bank fairly closely, and um, we're finding that they are. I mean, we're optimistic. Longer term, I think I think the main thing the central bank is they're trying to figure out how to get like more transparency into like the on and off ramp process, right? Um, for crypto in general. So yeah, I'm I'm optimistic that we have like more friendly regulation coming off over the, the next year or so. Um, but yeah, um, Abu Akar, um, I saw you were at Park Soul in Abuja recently. Are, are you still in Abuja? I know. Oh, okay. I was in, I came back from Abuja like two weeks ago. Ah, uh, okay. So maybe next time you're around, you can um, stop at, I uh, come around our office in Zone 6. Okay, but, um, sure. Yeah, um, so we, at Convexity, we have like a pretty active dev community. Um, and I'd like us to focus more on just the big Bitcoin ecosystem. So, what role do you feel like hubs like um, the Paxful hub in Abuja and Convexity, like what, what role do you, do you feel like we can play? in contributing to this? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's definitely a good question because this ties into the general education, um, I guess, question that we, we have to answer as a whole community. So I think the benefit of having folks like Paxful on the ground is they have that manpower, which is necessary for us to get folks to places where people need to learn more about Bitcoin. So I think in terms of how that will help or how we'll coordinate with people like you is to have folks on the ground with the right educational resources, then tag along the manpower that people like Pax will have to actually distribute this information to where it needs to be. So I think a lot more people and hubs will have to partner with folks like Paxful to mobilize and see how we could really get education to folks that actually need it. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Um, but just more specifically, um, so I, I don't know if you um, name them or convexity, do you? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, just more specifically, I mean, I could I could um, reach out to the Paxful guys, but I'm I'm really curious on like specific steps we can take um, to just 
like improve um you know work in the bitcoin ecosystem in abuja you know and just in nigeria generally so if there's, if there's any like specific ideas you already have um or like anything you maybe had like discuss with Paxwell and I can reach out to them just to you know know how that can work yeah yeah for sure and definitely hit me up offline so you can sync async on, on this as well but yeah, in general like I said, it depends on how the model you guys operate in, in your current hub, but I would assume you guys also have folks that come in and actually have sessions and, and, and things like that. So it could be a case where yeah, we do, yeah. you're getting, is that how it works? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it'll be a case where, yeah, yeah, it'll be a case where you guys will be pumping out a lot of the Bitcoin material that people need to learn about. So you start off from really, really early stage things like what's what's Bitcoin, you know, how to secure your keys, all of that. And then have yeah. it like a graduated step in terms of the sessions that you're running. So you could focus on the early stage info and then down the line you could start to scale it out through whether it's devs or people in general that want to work on self custody. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Also I am um, we're looking for lightning developers as well. I don't know if you can't make sense of recommendations. Especially if they are based in Abuja. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a general problem with the space and what Gal is trying to solve. But in general, we'll sync on that. Try and get oh, your okay. recommendations. Oh, okay. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Leo, go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry, I have a question for Mr. V. I I actually, you know, most of us are not very, you know, they are, we are not technical people. And... Um, I've been trying to process your FEDI initiative and uh, I'm just um, trying to see how I can summarize it. In in Bitcoin, we say, not your keys, not your coin. So in your initiative, can we say, not our keys, not our coins? That's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Is that like a summary? I, 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 can, I, can, I, can I take that? I'll, I'll credit you for that, Dr. Dr. Eze. <laughs> what I say is, is um, so the, the gold standard, or, or actually um, the Bitcoin standard, is to be, to be your own bank. Or as you say, not your keys, not your coin. But if you, for whatever reason, you're not able to do that, it's too costly for you, it's too complicated, technically complicated for you, or you're just not comfortable doing it. You're just not ready, you're not, you're not ready to do that. Then right now, for most people, their only choice is to either not be part of this revolution, this monetary revolution, or to hold their money with a third party uh, and exchange and another name for a third party is a stranger, someone you don't know. They don't know you. They just know whether you're going to pay them money, and that's it. And so what we have here, where Fediment is a halfway house, where you can come together as a community and handle your custody. So instead of it being your own bank, you can be your own community bank. Or as you just so eloquently put it, not our keys, not our coin. I love that. That's a great way of summarizing it. Perfect. I'm really glad we can coin some catchphrases here. So, uh, Obi, I was just wondering, uh, is there any form of regulation that could, let's say, hurt Fedi? Because we've seen a lot of crazy stuff being proposed in European Union. Uh, but it seems to me like this should be quite resilient to all kinds of stupid regulations, right? It's basically like an open source project that you can spin up in your circle, like with the Federation Guardians, and just go. Is that right? Um, so the short answer is yes, asterisk. Because it's always, when you're dealing with regulation, it's always an asterisk. Because one, regulation is country-specific, 200 countries in the world. Um, and all of them will have different regulation. And some of them, even within the country, will have, on a state-by-state -state basis, um, different regulation. Also, the way regulation works, um, when it comes to financial um, assets and financial products, 
is that um, they generally don't make it 100% clear what's in or out ever. They would just say, here are some examples of things that are likely out of regulation, exempt. And here are some examples of things that are likely in regulation. But it's always the devil's in the detail on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not possible to ever say something is definitely out or something is definitely in. Um, and you only know when you do. However, um, having run an exchange in the UK for eight years, the longest running exchange, um, Bitcoin exchange in the UK, um, being we were the first to be regulated in um, Gibraltar, one of the first to be regulated in Europe as an exchange. Um, we educated um, governments, um, MPs, police, um, um, government authorities and services um, in UK and Europe. Um, and we had multiple, um, uh, obviously, legal advice and regulatory advisors. I have a reasonable view um, of the, the state of regulation in, in, in terms of um, running um, or providing some sort of um, crypto-related service. And what you find is there's a number of um, common exemptions that if you fit within these exemptions, then it gives you a number of tools or arguments to suggest that you are exempt from regulation. Yeah. Obviously, so again, it depends on the jurisdiction. If you're in North Korea, it doesn't matter what you do. Even writing code for Bitcoin could be considered outside of regulation. So it's going to depend on where you are and your, on your context. And so one of the things about the Fediment um, structure Fediment is the actual community bank that is set up by members of your community. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that we can fall within, a correctly structured Fediment community can fall within multiple exceptions um, or multiple things that have been um, um, considered to be exemptions under in reasonable jurisdictions. I always say reasonable jurisdictions because I said, if you're talking about a dictatorship and so on, and it's not reasonable, you cannot really um, assume anything there. So one of those, for example, is unattended operation. Running a, a Feddy Mint um, server is similar to running a Bitcoin node. You just download the software, click run, and for all intents and purposes, that's all you need to do. As long as it has electricity, and as long as it has internet, it will just to continue to operate. If it loses electricity or internet, your power cut or your internet goes down and you, it will automatically, the next time you have internet and power, reconnect and carry on where it left off. You don't need to do anything, a bit like a set-top box or something, or, or your fridge. If you turn it off and on, it will just continue to carry on where it left off. So unattended operation is um, often seen as a indication that this thing is not being run by you because you're just running so you're just basically have a machine and you've turned it on effectively as opposed to something you're actively managing so that's one um exemption that if it is something that is considered an, um, an a, a point to consider uh, within your jurisdiction we we have as a part of the way the system operates another one is that um, and this is quite a common one, each individual guardian, if it's structured correctly, for example, let's say you have a, 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 a four of seven set up. So there's seven guardians and four need to act together to be able to, uh, or the, the, compu the computers of four of them need to act together to process a transaction. Then it means that no one person is able to act by themselves. So no one person has control over the um, the wallet, the community wallet. Again, um, FinCEN regulations in the US is an example where they say that that can be um, considered as evidence of being exempt from regulation if you do not have um, that ability to act alone. And other jurisdictions have that exemption. So we have that as well. Um, and many companies rely upon that exemption just by itself, for example, many large um, 
Bitcoin related companies. For example, people who provide multi-signature wallet services and so on. And then the next exemption, which we recommend doing, is to um, not to provide the service to friends, family, work colleagues, or people you have a pre-existing relationship with, and to not earn money from that. Now, again, all of these things are, are optional. You can set up a one-of-one -one multi sig for example. It wouldn't make much sense, but you could do that. Um, for example, you could be constantly on the computer of the Freddie Mint server and making code changes, but clearly that wouldn't be something that we recommend. And you could try, choose to charge fees if you chose to. Um, but if you chose not to, then there's a very strong exemption, which are not, which is commonly um, used not just in Bitcoin, but across all financial services, which is the consideration of whether you are running, do performing an action by way of business. So i.e., if you are not looking to make money from it, you're providing it to friends or family, that's a strong example that you're not doing it by way of business. If you are looking to make money from it, and if you're providing it for strangers and so on, these all tend to into suggest that you're doing it by way of business. Again, if you feel it fits within that exemption, that's a quite a strong common exemption, and that predates Bitcoin. To, a, an example being, if you are a father or a mother and you have a piggy bank for your kid, you are holding money on behalf of your kid. But because you're not doing it by way of business, you're not going to be considered a licensed regulated custodian. If you are going to the shop and your your friend gives you some money to say, could you buy some um, some super malt for me from the shop? You know, you are not considered a payment institute or money service um, provider because um, you're not doing that action by way of business. Although technically you are transferring, using money and using it to um, provide payment for some good remotely you would again not be considered a, performing a regulated activity. Even if you someone asks you, should I buy Bitcoin? And you say, yes, you should buy Bitcoin and here's where you're buying it. Most regulators wouldn't consider you providing financial advice and therefore you regu ask you to be regulated as a financial advisor because you're not providing that advice with the view to make money from the user. You're just telling a friend your opinion. So again, it's not that exemption is not you're not providing it by way of business. So again, again, someone could decide tomorrow that, you know what, whenever someone holds money for anyone in any context, even if it's their father for their kid, or even if some, then that could be considered a, a regulatory activity. But it's, but you can imagine that would start to become very difficult to, to, um, to enforce or police because we do this all the time, every day. We do activities which, are actually financial activities, but we're just not, but the key differentiator is we're not doing it by way of business. So that'd be a very difficult exemption to, to, to um, bypass and argue why this action here is somehow different from the remainder. Okay, thank you for walking us through it. So you definitely know your stuff in terms of navigating regulations. So you mentioned you have just one hour, so I don't want to hold you up any longer. And maybe for some parting words, what do you think is needed most in Nigeria for Bitcoin adoption to proceed smoothly? Um, I think we have all the elements we need. We have incredibly resourceful people. We've got incredibly intelligent people and passionate people. Um, and we have technology and tools and the tools that are missing are all coming within the next six to 12 months. We have technologies like Feddy and Feddy Mint. We have um, um, just across, across the border, we have one of the first um, Bitcoin conferences happening in West Africa. We have technologies like Hole Punch and Keat that are coming through. Um, we have advances in the lightning network uh, like like tarot that are reaching levels of adoption so the tools are there and the brain power the brain trust is there i'm i'm just waiting to see the magic happen over the next 12 to, to 24 months perfect sounds very optimistic so where can we learn more about feddy 
Um, Fedi, so you can go to our, our Twitter and our website. So our Twitter is Fedi, F-E-D-I-B-T-C. And our website is FEDI.XYZ. Or sometimes you say FEDI, like in FEDI Nights, as in Star Wars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and then to find out um, Fedi Mint, which is the protocol that Fedi is the wallet for the protocol, is FediMint.org. It's an open source protocol. If you are a talented engineer, um, and are interested in supporting open source um, software, I would highly recommend that you check out Fediment. It's a really exciting project. It's doing something really important for the world. Um, and those are the two ones. Yes, myself and Obi, the Twitter at OBI, um, Fediment, Fediment.org, and Fedi is Fedi.xyz. Z, actually. <laughs> XYZ. Yeah, XYZ. All right, perfect. Thank you for today's session, Obi. And I would like to ask Abu Bakar as well, like, what do you think? Uh, are there any obstacles for adoption or is everything perfect in place in Nigeria? Yeah, I mean, on a theoretical level, everything is perfect as far as I'm concerned. But in general, we just need to get everything in motion, which is happening already. So for us, it's just to continue to push on the ground both on the regulator front, on the education front, and as well as building. And obviously for us as, as a fund as well, there's also the opportunity of actually pushing forward projects that we want in the space by investments as well. So there's a lot of things to do. Like Obi said, a lot of it is already in place. It's just for us to continue to push through and see how we could get to where we need to be. Can I just say one thing is, one, I would like to thank Abu Bakr for his support and investment in Fedi, um, he's already delivered a huge amount of value. A number of our investors really said that we have to have um, recursive as an investor. And I've already, as a, as a beneficiary, seen the benefit of having recursive. They're one of the incredibly hardworking, helpful VC firm to invest. Um, and they know the local market really well. And also, thank you, I feel like well, everybody in this call, but um, Dr. Eze and people who have been sort of um, faithful uh, um, supporters of, of, of CoinFlow and other work I've done in the past. I really appreciate this. It means a lot. And it makes me continue to want to work on, on helping hyper Bitcoinization happen. Perfect. Thank you. So if there are no further questions from our listeners, and let me know if there are. But if there are not, then I believe this session is successfully over. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Abu Bakar and Obi and Heritage and Dr. Rio and Uyoyo and all our listeners. Uh, follow the projects that have been mentioned, Kuala, Bitrust, Fedi, Fedimint, and of course, Abu Bakar and Obi. And be sure to follow Trezor as well. We will have another session in two weeks, this time focused on Togo, on Bitcoin adoption in Togo. So thanks, everyone, and have a good evening and have a nice day. Thanks, Joseph. Bye. Thanks, Obi, Bye. and everyone else building in space. <laughs> really appreciate your work. Thanks, thanks, yeah, thanks everyone. Bye. This was very insightful. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you soon. Bye, guys.